Welcome to the Drawing Board by Tabitha Pai, where today I'll be talking about complex eigenvalues and how to solve these systems of differential equations when your eigenvalues end up having a complex form. As a review, let's just quickly go over how we can actually just find uh, the solutions for systems of differential equations if we're using typical eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So I like to think of this as kind of three steps. And the first step, almost like step zero, is you have to put these in matrix form. So we're going to have, uh, say we have a system that would look something like this. So if we saw a system of just two equations, a two-dimensional system, where we have our x1 and our x2, our two uh, dependent variables. And also in the other side, we have as independent variables, those same ones, just not derived. If you recall, if we have a 2D system like this, we can rewrite this pretty simply in matrix form, where it just looks like a capital X, typically, capital X prime is equal to A times capital X. And remember that the capital X is just a column vector, where we have the lowercase x1 and lowercase x2. And when we differentiate this, this just turns into those other differentials. And then that A vector, in this case, is just a, uh, or the A matrix is just a two by two in this case. And it would literally just look like pulling these constants where we have just A, B, C, and D. So here's the first thing for just getting in that form. Moving on to the actual use of eigenvalues, we have to just find those as our step one. So we're finding those lambda values, which are eigenvalues. And we do that by using the characteristic equation, which is if we have that A vector, or that A matrix, minus lambda times our identity matrix. And if we take the determinant of that, that should equal 0. And if we just rewrite this a little uh, more laid out from our form, we'll basically just have the A minus our lambda, B by itself, c by itself, and then d minus lambda. And we take that determinant, that should equal 0. So we will do that and then solve for, in this case, we would have both a lambda 1 and a lambda 2, since we have a two-dimensional system. Then if we keep going on to our second step, now that we have our eigenvalues, we want to find our eigenvectors, which we show as a capital V. So we will find those eigenvectors by going once again to uh, an equation that's really similar to our characteristic, characteristic equation for step one. But instead of having a determinant, we'll just have that a minus lambda i and times our vector v. That should then equal 0. So we're going to take that equation and plug in each uh, of our lambda, in this case, lambda 1 and our lambda 2. And if we look at the actual form of our eigenvector, that capital V will be a vector of lowercase u and lowercase v. And so when we take this characteristic equation and plug in our values, we'll end up with a system of two equations where it will look like a minus lambda times our first term u plus bv, and that will equal 0. And then the other equation will be c times u plus d minus lambda b and that times v. And that should also equal 0. So we will plug in those values and then solve these equations for our u and for our v. So the third and final step is just putting this all together. So we're actually just going to find our vector x, which is our solution vector. And we will do that by using the superposition principle once again. We just have the capital X is c1 capital X1 plus C2 capital X2. And then now we're going to be finding those vectors X1 and X2 just from this equation that I'll write out. So here are those two equations. We have capital X1 and capital X2. And those just end up being the eigenvector V times the exponential raised to our lambda times t. So we'll have two of those. And then once again, we'll put those together. And then we'll end up with their actual solution that will be of this form. So moving on to the actual new topic, which is what if we have a complex 
eigenvalue? And how do we actually work with those numbers when we're solving? So as a reminder, if we have a complex no number, it will be of the form alpha for the real part. And then we have plus or minus beta times i, the imaginary square root of negative 1. And another way you could see this written out, which can be a little confusing for people, is you can also call it where we have just lambda is always alpha minus beta i. And then you could have the complex conjugate, which is lambda bar. And that is what's equal to alpha plus beta i. So you could see it either form. It really ends up being the same thing, where now that you have that imaginary component, you have to deal with that in your eigenvectors and thus your solutions. So as a result of this, if we look at our eigenvector, our capital V, instead of just having a u and a lowercase v, it's not going to look like that. It will have those two values, but they will be of the form a plus bi, and then another a plus bi. And so we'll just show those as a1 and b1 and a2 and b2. But it will now have these other components to it. So when we actually go down and plug into our solutions, it's not quite as simple as just having these eigenvectors put into our equation for our solution vector, capital X. So in order to show this, we're actually going to use a different letter. We're going to show our uh, part of our solution as a capital Z. And this will, again, be another vector, because it will be our eigenvector times our e to the lambda t. And this is usually our solution. But in this case, this is the first step of it, because this lambda is, once again, actually equal to an alpha plus or minus beta i. And again, you would often see this as just a minus beta i, just to have a single solution that you can work through. So then we can expand this out. And this is not unique to eigenvectors or anything like that. This is just, in general, complex forms can be rearranged like this. And so this will ultimately be still our vector, still our exponential, but it will be e to the alpha t. And then we will have two terms. We'll have a cosine of our beta t. And then we'll add a sine of our beta t. But that will actually be multiplied by or imaginary number i. So essentially what we've done is we've said, instead of just having this typical real solution, we expand this out and have a couple other terms. And if we put this together, we actually have to still use that same uh, superposition principle. Our x will still be c1 cap x1 plus c2 cap x2 for a 2D system. But those x1 and x2 are actually only pieces of our z we've written out. So that will basically be where our x1 is the so-called real parts or the real coefficients of that z. So we will show that by doing re of our capital Z. And then x2 will be the imaginary parts, the imaginary coefficients. So we'll show that as im of z. And this is kind of nebulous right now, but I think it'll make a lot more sense if we just look at a solution and see this being done. But as a summary, if we have a complex eigenvalues, and we'll just focus on a 2D system, it will look like where we have lambda is alpha minus beta i, and then the conjugate will be alpha plus beta i. Because of that, our eigenvector will have both real and imaginary parts to each of the terms in it. And from that, we will rewrite our solution in this form right here. And that vector z, we can plug in to our solution by splitting it into the real and the imaginary parts of it. So let's jump into a solution and see this all in action. So here we have an example of a 2D system. We have two differential equations that we're going to be solving using uh, the eigenvector method. And spoiler alert, we're going to end up with some complex numbers we're going to run into. So let's just get started. And we can start by solving this like any other eigenvector problem, which we'll have to start with step zero, 
which is just putting in matrix form. So we're going to be putting in terms of cap x prime is equal to a cap x. And so in this case, we're going to have cap x is our x1 and our x2 and our a matrix. We're going to have the x1 equation on the top because we have x1, x2 here, and then our x2 equations coefficients. So here's the other ones. So this will just end up being, we have our A matrix is a two by two, and it'll just be our four here, our negative three here, and we have just a three here, and then a positive four here. So we have all of those in our two by two A matrix. So with this, we can go on to actually solving for our eigenvectors. So moving on to actually finding these eigenvalues on to technically our first step. So once again, we're going to write out that characteristic equation, which is the determinant of a minus lambda i is equal to zero. And if we keep writing that out, it'll end up being that we have a uh, nice trick I like looking at is just writing out our values and spacing them out a little bit more. So we have four, negative three, three and a four, and then just subtracting off lambda from each of those diagonals. So we'll have four minus lambda here, and then four minus lambda here. And if we keep doing the actual determinant of that, remember that we're gonna just have multiplying these diagonals, which in this case are terms with lambda, and then we'll be subtracting those terms on the other diagonal. So in other words, this will end up being four minus lambda times itself, and then subtracting three times minus three, which ends up being a positive nine, and that is going to be equal to zero. So now if we keep solving this, we can rewrite this into a quadratic equation. This will end up being lambda squared minus eight lambda plus 25, and that's equal to zero. So we could either use the quadratic equation to solve this, or we could look at, at the fact that even back here, we could figure out those complex values because we know that we're gonna have a positive out here, we need to cancel with a negative, but this is squared, so we know that this term in here needs to end up being a negative nine. So let's write it out this way. So we know that four minus lambda squared, all squared, it's gonna be that negative nine and if we go on to that, we can say that four minus lambda is equal to the square root of negative nine. And so right away, we know that this has to be complex values because we know that we can't take an actual square root of a negative number. So if we keep writing that out, it ends up being where this is a, we can pull out the squared number, which is just a three, but it's still gonna be three times the square root of negative one, which, is 3i. So then we can just rearrange this a little more and say that lambda is equal to our, a, our 3i over here. And we're going to switch these numbers around and it en ends up being a 4 minus our 3i. So this is the normal form of lambda. And then once again, the complex conjugate just fitting up here is going to be lambda bar, which is 4 plus three i. So here I've just rewritten what we just found, which is we have lambda is four minus three i, that's what we'll start plugging in. And then I also just rewrote our, uh, our a matrix up here. So now we can continue on to actually using this value where we will find those vectors. So those eigenvectors we'll find using the equation a minus lambda times our identity matrix, and then all times our vector v. So if we keep writing this out, what this will look like is what we already had written out on the other page, which was where we just have the four minus lambdas on the diagonals and then three and negative three. So we'll have, once again, we'll just have that written out, and this time it's not in a determinant, and we'll just have four minus lambda, then we'll have a negative three, three, four minus lambda. And then that eigenvector, uh, technically it's, it's gonna be in a different form and not just values u and v, but I'm just gonna leave them as u and v just to make it 
simpler when we keep writing it out. And this is all going to be equal to zero, and we could just write that out. So usually at this point, we would go and actually just plug in those individual values, lambda 1 and lambda 2. But because we have a complex eigenvalue, we're actually just going to plug in that form and not the complex conjugate form. So uh, since we just have 4 minus lambdas here, we can just think about what that is. So it's 4 minus lambda is just equal to 4 minus 4 minus 3i minus is cancel. And that ends up just being equal to 3i. So if we rewrite this, these matrices, we'll just plug in that for our diagonals. So here's what we have up here, just rewritten with our three i's. And then we can write this out in matrix form. And so we will rewrite this into two equations. So first, we'll take that first row, multiply it by the first column. So they'll just be three i times our u, and then plus a minus three, so just minus three times our v. And so that is our first equation, equal to zero. And then on the bottom, we'll just have the second row. So three times our u, and then plus this time our three i times v, and that's equal to zero. So if you notice something about these equations, and this is something that's come up before of the quirks of working with these eigenvector problems, is that these equations can be manipul manipulated a little bit and in this case, they are independent equations. They're not literally just the same thing with a coefficient multiplied by one of them. But we can just divide out and simplify this a little bit. And we can just divide each of them by three. We just have all these three terms. So we can just call this i by itself times u minus v by itself, and then equal to zero. Then the other one, just u plus i times v is equal to zero. So now we can just focus on those two equations and try and figure out what we could plug in to make this true for our values of u and v. So this can look a little uncanny and not you might not be quite used to working with these i's. So just to reiterate, i is defined as the square root of negative 1. So if we square our i, we end up with a negative 1. So keeping that in mind, if we look at these, we have to think about what would make i times some value minus some other value equal to 0, and what would make a value plus i times that same value up here would make that equal to 0. So if you think about this for a second, you just realize that 1 and i work out. If we put a 1 here, and we put an i here, and a 1 here, an i here, this ends up being equal to just i by itself minus i by itself, and that clearly is 0. And then on the bottom equation, we have 1 plus i times i, i squared. And by definition, that is going to be negative 1. So 1 minus 1 is also clearly 0. So from that, we have shown that our eigenvector, which is composed of that u and v, which we showed were a 1 and an i, that is going to be our final eigenvector. So our eigenvector is equal to column vector with components i on the bottom and then 1 on the top. So finally, we can move on to our last step, which is finding our actual solution vector cap x. And there's definitely a little bit more involved than just the real solutions, or the, val the solutions where we have real eigenvalues, because we will use that superposition principle, but it's not quite going to be tho those equations. So recall that we're going to start off by just finding a vector z. So z is kind of the catch-all solution, where it's our eigenvector v times e to our lambda t, and that is going to be expanded out, where we have our eigenvalue. It's i on the bottom, 1 on the top. And then our eigenvalue will be a 4 minus 3i, all that times t. So typically, we would write this out and have where our z is equal to just our v, e, the real part alpha, 
times t. So this would be alpha, this would be beta. And we would typically just have a cosine of beta t plus our i sine beta t. But in this case, we're not quite going to write that out because we do have in our complex eigenvalue, we have a minus sign right here. So that minus sign will actually carry down. So we'll see where it's r1 and i on the outside. And then we have e to the 4, our real component, t. But then in here, we do have the cosine of our 3i. And we're going to have that uh, minus sign actually go right here. We have minus i times the sine of our 3i. And you could also write this out by just plugging in the minus sign um, into the other values. But this, we could just end up using this equation here for actual z. So let's keep writing this out and actually multiply these two, or this uh, matrix and this values in here. So our z, once again, we can just pull out that e to the 4t to make it simple. But if we multiply this by that, we end up with the first row, just the 1. And so both of these values will just stay the same. So I'll write those out. So just rewriting that, that's our cosine 3t minus i sine of 3t. I did actually make the mistake writing out before. These are t's up here and not i's. But once again, that just stays the same. Now the bottom is going to be a little different because we have i times those two terms. So that we can just put in front of that cosine, just have i cosine of our 3t. However, we could write out a minus i squared. But recall that if we take that and do minus i squared, that's really minus minus 1 or just a positive 1. So we might as well just simplify that and write out plus sine of our 3t. So now we have this whole equation here. And we're going to have to split this into its real and imaginary components. So I mentioned before that it's a little easier to just see this happening than explain it all. So I'm going to show it. So recall, we're just going to have our re of z, or our real component of the coefficients of this. And this will be equal to all these real values. So if we look up here, we have a cosine of 3t. That's completely real, no i's in sight. Sine of 3t, that is also completely real. So we're just going to have both of these values in a vector with our e to the 4t. So we've written that out. And remember that this is equal to our first part of our solution vector, our cap x1. So now we can go on to the second x uh, solution vector, which is the imaginary part of z. So now we're going to look at those other coefficients. So we're just going to have over here our sine of 3t. And it's actually the minus sine of 3t. And we don't include that i because we just want the coefficients or the terms without the i here. So that will be on the top. And then over here, we have just the cosine 3 of t by itself. So once again, we'll write this out. So here are those coefficients of the imaginary components. And once again, that is our x2. So now we can go on, and we're basically at the point where we can solve this like any other real eigenvector problem. So. Once again, we have the superpos superposition principle where we have our cap x is c1 cap x1 plus c2 cap x2. And we can just keep writing this out with what we have here. So we have x is equal to c1 times our e4t. And then we're going to have cosine 3t and then a sine 3t. And then we'll go on and we'll have our c2 and then our e4t and then our negative sine 3t, and then our cosine of 3t. And if we were given some initial parameters, we could keep solving this. But with this problem, this is our final solution vector. So going back to the original problem, we were starting with these uh, set of equations. And if you end up writing this out, you end up with this is your solution. And with that, we've covered all of those little tidbits for changing our typical solution where we
start with matrix form, finding those eigenvalues, finding those eigenvectors, and then finding the solution. And we've showed those couple things you need to think about if you have a complex set of eigenvalues. You first take and find your z vector, then you find those real and imaginary components of that, and then that can then be plugged in to your uh, vector for solutions, cap x. So with that, that is everything we've covered. This has been the Drawing Board by Tau Pi. Thank you for watching.